fight or flight. It's a question posed in nature each and every day. When faced with danger, it's time to stand your ground or run for your life to fight another day. Ultimate predators in fresh water. Lions own the title on dry land. They seldom mess with each other. At least that's what tourist Brian Pettigrew thought before he witnessed lions and crocodiles facing off in no man's land. We were on safari in Kenya on the Masai Mara. And our guide suggested going out to the Mara River. We pulled up to the river and we almost drove over these five male lions. And as we were watching them, we looked down to the left and we saw this hippo carcass with crocodiles beginning to just feed on it. Crocodiles, lions, and almost one ton of carcass spells one deadly border dispute. But the lions will think twice before they enter the water. Those lions are strong. They're probably stronger than the, the average crocodile there. But should those lions venture into the water, into the crocodile domain, they lose that advantage and they will then become more vulnerable. If you can't beat them, call for backup. The females started coming down and they were certainly more aggressive. They would go right out into the water, inches away from the crocodile's snout. It really became a big tug of war battle between them. In a situation like this, where both predators really want to feed on the hippo, you actually never know what might happen. Females did not back down. They raised up those paws and just hit them right on their snouts. time that I ever see a crocodile actually really fight back and try and take a bite out of one of the, the lions. If the crocodile had been a fraction of a second faster, it would have crushed the lion's skull. That was probably the scariest moment. in the wild, life moves fast. To capture the action, you've got to be in the right spot at just the right time. It was amazing. My God! We were speechless. Amazing amateur and professional footage revealing incredible animal behavior is analyzed by top wildlife experts to reveal the secret lives of animals in motion. hunters. To bring down prey almost four and a half times their size, they need to work together. But that's not what Christoph and Natalie Rue witnessed during a trip to South Africa's Kruger Park. They woke up early in the morning to have a game drive. As I was driving at the corner of my eyes, I've seen that thing jumping. It's a lone lioness trying to take on an injured buffalo. So we are very, very excited. Almost panicking, looking around for the camera. The buffalo makes one final charge, but it's too weak, and the lioness moves in for the kill. She started then eating his hind legs, so he couldn't you know, walk any further. By wrestling a 680 kilogram buffalo, this lioness might have bitten off a little more than she can chew. I actually thought that she wouldn't be able to, to take down that big buffalo. She's trying to wrestle.
wrestle the buffalo onto its side to expose the neck and belly. But this is a job for at least three specialized hunters. I thought that, you know, the pride would come along or other lionesses, you know, just to help her. But maybe an hour later, we realized that she's wanting to take this buffalo down all by herself. Even though it's injured, the buffalo is still a force to be reckoned with. It's actually really She took it very cautiously. She was never anywhere near the head of the buffalo or the neck. Always trying to bring it down from the back, exhaust it, pull it down. The end is in sight. But then, there is a new arrival. Elephants don't like lions much at all. They will take any opportunity to chase them off and disturb them if they can. The drama isn't over yet. You would think that the elephant would just carry on walking. see this kind of thing uh, only once in the last time and uh, that we were just right there at the right moment. The buffalo now has a shot at survival, proving that no gesture is too small to make a huge difference. Hippos are fiercely territorial and they'll attack just about anything that wanders into their waters. Tourists Ryan Corbin and John Z. Leaf got a unique glimpse of hippo aggression along Africa's Mara River. I was on a uh, hunting trip with my father-in-law and four other friends in Kenya. And on the third day when we were driving around, we noticed that there were hundreds and thousands of animals piling up near a river so we drove down to the river. The animals have already started crossing the river. Ryan and Johnsy find themselves filming one of nature's greatest spectacles. These mass migrations of the zebra and the wildebeest don't happen at the same time every year, so it's extremely lucky for Ryan and Johnsy to arrive at the spot and see all the action right in front of them. Wildebeest faced a 12 meter drop, but their problems are only starting as crocodiles wait downstream, ready for the current to swoop a hapless wildebeest right into their gaping jaws. Another river resident joins the fray. The hippo was very active in the river and obviously was not happy that all the other animals were there. The last few stragglers make it through the river, but others aren't so lucky. And this one large crocodile did get a wildebeest in its jaws, but it was near where the hippopotamus was. John Z continues filming as 1,800 kilograms of angry hippo charges towards the crocodile. We weren't certain what was going to happen. Get him, hippo. He's gone. He bit it. Hippo has a massive gait with these elongated canines and sharp incisors that could inflict a deadly bite, even to something like this well-armored crocodile. The hippo's 800 kilogram bite force mauls the crocodile. Not bad for a herbivore. 
But as soon as he lets it go, the hippo seems to lose interest and then goes after the carcass. There goes the carcass. As if attacking a prehistoric predator is not enough, this herbivore is now chomping on this wildebeest carcass. If there is one occasion to have a camera handy, this is it. It truly was the most spectacular trip that I've ever taken things that we got to witness with our own eyes was etched in my mind and probably will be forever. The cheetah is by far the fastest land animal on the planet with a velocity of 100 kilometers per hour. That's three times faster than the human sprinting record. But being able to run like the wind doesn't mean you always have to. Danny Van Furen found this out during a holiday in Botswana. Me and my wife was on holiday in the Kalahari when one morning early we decided to drive up all the way to Kanaka's water hole. Botswana is a semi-desert and temperatures can reach up to 43 degrees centigrade. In this heat, a water hole is a sure spot for filming wildlife. When we arrived at the water hole, that was when we were surprised to see there was cheetah busy drinking water there. Once he quenches his thirst, the cheetah spots a potential main course. It started to walk up north, and when I looked up north, I saw there was a red hot piece in the grass busy grazing and it looked to me like the cheetah was starting to stop. Normally cheetahs stalk to within 50 meters of their prey, then they explode into the attack. But there's no point in chasing when the prey isn't running. My heart was beating like hell because that's a once in a lifetime scene that you see and it was right in front of us. This cheetah is almost three times smaller than the heart of beast. But luckily, he's not alone. The first one was stalking and the two others, they were just slowly following behind him. And the red hearted beast had no idea that he was there. The cheetah just keeps on stalking. The cheetah was coming and it was coming and it was coming. It took ages for it. He stopped till he was right next to the heart of beast. Although cheetahs are built for speed, there was nothing fast about this hunt. And this just shows how adaptable predators are in different conditions. He just got up and he grabbed it behind the neck and tried to pull it down. Bored with waiting on the sidelines, others join the fight. And to me, that was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I don't think I will ever see that in my life again. A huge crocodile latches onto a female elephant's trunk when she tries to take a drink. She falls to her knees as the struggle intensifies. With tremendous effort, the elephant counters the croc's weight and drags him onto land. Just as she yanks herself free, her calf trips over the predator, but all escape unharmed. Fight or flight. 
It's a question posed in nature each and every day. When faced with danger, it's time to stand your ground or run for your life to fight another day. But on a game-ranging course in South Africa, Australian actor David Lazarus found himself in a situation where both options spelled death. It was a 28-day course to become a field guide or like a game ranger. It was probably about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The lead guide said, you know, they can go in and check out the line. And initially it was a bit like, wow, okay, three lines, <laughs> on foot. Outside a vehicle, the lions have the upper hand. The group is now depending on the lead guide's experience and they need to follow his every command second by second. We're only there for about maybe two or three minutes. But then the one just got up. He was coming around, coming sort of closer towards us. And everyone is feeling a bit, you know, a little bit unsettled. As soon as they give that mobile, they're basically saying, please go away, we don't want you here. The range instructs us to, to keep walking back. Worst case scenario, someone would turn from that group and run. Shouting is the last line of defense before using their guns. Even though they need to protect the students, no guide wants to shoot one of these majestic animals. One of the techniques that you can employ is to try and intimidate the lions. So you shout at them, you stand tall, anything to sort of impose yourself on the lions. Shouting ceases to be intimidating, but passing rangers hear their cries for help. It was a very nice sight seeing the vehicle come up towards us. We drove a little bit forward to see if we can see the line, and near they stood one, two, three, staring straight at us. That vehicle never came. I don't know what we would have done. Impalas are regarded as one of the noisiest bovids. The roaring of territorial males can be heard from over one and a half kilometers away. But when one animal's territorial roar becomes another animal's dinner bell, Ronnie and Erica Hamilton witness something extremely rare. I can my man was in the career of time make vacation geweest. Ons het van um the next morning we decided to take a roundabout route. But the Hamiltons find the route blocked by two impala in mid battle. Dit was een trente gevecht tussen hulle want hulle was van een kant van die pad naar die andere kant van die pad geweest. The leopard attack is quite unexpected, as this leopard seldom hunts in broad daylight. When I saw this clip of the leopard catching me in Paula, I thought to myself, I wish I was there, because it really is the most incredible piece of action. From the moment I saw the leopard or the Paula, it was as if everything was in slow motion. 
if you look carefully, you'll see that this young male leopard actually has a full belly. So it means he probably was feeding the, the day before and then stumbled upon these two impalas. So probably a very opportunistic kill. <laughs> This young leopard is definitely using the typical strangle technique that leopards use to kill their prey, straight for the throat to avoid those sharp horns. And it's an unbelievably mooi mooi die die word. I can't even say how mooi it is. I just came so now by seeing it. Life in the Arctic is chilling. At a frosty minus 34 degrees Celsius, competition for food is hot and heavy. Here in Churchill, Canada, professional guide Brad Josephs would see just how heated the fight for food can get. Churchill is the ultimate place in the world to see polar bears. As October comes around and things start cooling off and ice starts forming on the ponds and the rivers, bears just come out of nowhere. I noticed this one day from a distance, there was a very large concentration of polar bears. So of course we headed over there. When you're in polar bear country, obey the golden rule, stay in the vehicle. Especially when these loners by nature find that their habitat is getting a little crowded. There's generally a segregation of sexes where adult males stay on the coast and females with dependent young move far inland. The situation becomes volatile when a female and her two large cubs wander straight towards a group of hungry males. When I saw this female approach these, these large males, of course I was a little bit concerned that there's a possible chance that one of these males might kill the cub. Brad has good reason to be concerned. In spite of their size, the cubs are still in danger. Cannibalism does occur in polar bears, and it generally occurs with dependent young. The female is not able to successfully protect the cub, and the larger bear will kill the cub and eat it. There was one particular large male that came right up to her and started checking her cub out. He got too close, and she just lost it. That male took one look at her and backed up. The body posture of the bear is very telling. And as she charges him, he keeps his head down low. And at times, he actually buries his nose into the snow in order to protect his muzzle, his neck, and any other soft tissue. clear and, and, and getting across that message you know, if you're going to mess with a bear it's not going to be me one thing that will stop a 500 kilogram male is a blaze of maternal instincts safety in numbers few animals understand the value of this better than the wild dog although relatively small in stature they compensate with a well-orchestrated pack hunt. Ranger Hobbs de Horror would see the unimaginable violence of ending up on the wrong side of the pack. So we were on the afternoon game drive. The guests that I was with, they wanted to see wild dogs hunt. As if on cue, the guests don't wait long for their request. When I look, I saw wild dog chasing this baby kudu. Taking down a kudu fawn without the rest of the pack is risky, but this nomad is driven by hunger and chooses to act as a one dog pack. When I got there, this baby kudu was very, very exhausted. 
To the tourist's horror, the wild dog begins to eat the calf alive. Wild dogs kill their prey by disemboweling, and even though this looks gruesome, it's actually a very efficient way of bringing down prey, much faster than any of the other large African predators. The people at the back of the car, they were making sounds. But the hunt is not over. At a distance, we saw other dogs running around coming. So then we thought maybe they are from the same pack and they are coming to finishing up the baby kudu. The pack isn't here to join in the feast. This is their territory and rival dogs are unwelcome intruders. Ranger Hobbs de Horo and his guests have been privileged to get a close-up look at a wild dog hunting solo. But when the resident pack arrives, the hunter becomes the hunted. Wild dogs are fiercely territorial, and when packs encounter each other, there are nearly always fatalities. So one dog against this large pack really had no chance. The attack is relentless and nothing short of brutal. Even seasoned guide Hobbs finds it hard to stomach. It was not easy to watch that kill. Uh, not, not, not easy at all. The sheer force of the attack ensures that it's all over in less than a minute. The rival dog didn't even suffer because he was grabbed and he was dead as they left. An awesome hunt for food turns into a brutal fight for real estate. For Hobbs, this day ended on a bittersweet note. They were making the squeaking sound like when they are happy. It was my first time to see dogs killing each other. And to me, it was heartbreaking. Lynette van der Linde and Kevin Margolius find themselves in a pastoral scene surrounded by grazing zebra and wildebeest. A commotion behind the vehicle shatters the peace. An adult zebra is attacking a wildebeest calf, trampling it into the asphalt. The reason is most likely territorial. The zebra and wildebeest herds both leave the calf behind, thinking it's dead. But miraculously, the calf survives and catches up with his mother. Nature is the ultimate theater. Catching jaw-dropping moments on tape requires vigilance, nerves of steel, and while filming an African cat called a serval, cameraman Tyson Langer learned that patience is key. I've been following this serval for two weeks, uh, hoping I'll get something for the series I was making. Servals are tricky to capture on camera, but with luck and patience, Tyson could get shots that many filmmakers have only dreamed of. Servals are solitary cats that are often very secretive and they live in these environments where they're surrounded by tall grass. Keeping up with the serval is testing the crew's skills and physical endurance, but it's not all in vain. She started getting used to us and she coming closer, closer and closer to us. For her to allow Tyson close enough to film her is truly incredible. He must have worked really hard to win her trust. Later, we found this server lying on the patch of grass. You could see clearly she was in the pain. We thought maybe she was sick. The crew knows that they can't interfere, so they stay close by and continue to record the cat in pain. But the cat's distress soon leads to one of nature's little miracles. When these kittens
things come out, they obviously still have the fetal membranes around them. So what the mother does is she removes it immediately to help them breathe, but also to remove that smell, and that just reduces the chance of predators finding them. She cleaned, 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 then, and then she gives the second one. She cleaned up again, so we thought that was enough. She turned around and uh, she gave the last bit. Tyson hits the jackpot as he gets to film rare footage of a serval giving birth. Tyson can consider himself extremely lucky and privileged to have witnessed this. The mother needs time to bond with her three kittens, so the crew leaves her for a few days. It turns out that she was a great mother, the way she was handling her cubs. It was incredible sighting to catch on film. sub-adult males constantly playing in the trees, a lot of sort of social behaviour going on. And in this time we really got to know them quite well. These lions are known for taking large game, giraffe, hippo, harassing other animals. The young lions are terrorising the locals like a group of juvenile delinquents. But you need brains as well as brawn, and they're about to meet their match. Suddenly in came a rhino. You can see the curiosity spark up immediately. Perhaps the lions were upwind, or maybe the rhino's bad eyesight is to blame. Either way, the rhino is surrounded. The rhino, he was sort of turning around to face the lions, and another lion would come in from the back, and then he would turn around to face that one. This rhino isn't going out without a fight. This clip is brilliant. You're seeing completely abnormal behavior from this rhino. A normal rhino would actually run away from a pride of lions, whereas this rhino confronts an entire pride of lions. The young lions realize that they're better off picking on someone their own size. Lesson learned. And in the end, the lions went back to doing what they do best. It was just sleeping under the bushes. And the rhino just went off into the distance. Leopards aren't fussy eaters. When it comes to meat, they'll eat anything. Wildlife guide Andre Thienison and Celeste Smith discovered just how far leopards are willing to go to get a meal. I've been working at Sabi Sand as a guide for nine years, and one night we were out on a game drive with some tourists. The next moment I told Andre to stop because I saw a porcupine at the corner of my eye. And as we were going back, this leopard was stalking the porcupine. The porcupine's 30 centimeter long quills can easily take out the leopard's eye. And if it can't see, it can't hunt. The, uh, the leopard definitely knew that he was at risk. He kept circling, trying to get to the porcupine's soft side. It was amazing seeing this leopard 
running around in circles trying to tie this porcupine out. This leopard is taking a massive risk attacking a porcupine. The threatened porcupine actually raises its quills and then backs up towards the leopard to stab it with more than 111 in spikes. To Celeste and Andre, this looks like an impossible attack. But then... So when the leopard caught this porcupine and he came to rest, he was looking like a porcupine. Even though the quills aren't poisonous, they still hurt. And out in the wild, infections can be deadly. But for now, the leopard chooses to focus on his well-deserved kill. And then his wife's beside It's very special. You don't see this every day. And it was pure luck that I had a camera with me as well. When we got back to the camp, it was just amazing. I just want to tell everyone what was happening. We saw the leopard a week later, and he had a small wound on his chest, but nothing serious. The hunt could have gone very wrong, but this is obviously one lucky leopard. Out in the wild, one is a vulnerable number. That's what this young baboon will discover when he sets off to establish a troop of his own. At least Matt Enright and his wife Sharon have each other on what's so far an uneventful safari. My wife and I were traveling in the Western Serengeti. We'd started out early that morning and drove around quite a bit that day. We did, we did not see a lot. But Matt and Sharon are about to get an eyeful when they cross paths with a lone male baboon something came out of the brush, which was, we realized, a baboon. We realized there were a bunch of lions on this riverbed. While we were there, one of the lions got up. She stopped at a point and, and crouched down. We were all pretty excited. You know, I had wanted to see a kill for a while, so I thought this is probably my chance. Lions are Africa's apex hunters and can take down prey over 60 times the size of a baboon. For the lioness, this primate is a snack. When she pounced, we thought at that point that the lioness was going to attack the, the baboon and that would be it. But neither the Enrights nor the lioness expect what happens next. A lone baboon is out to establish a new troop, but he wanders straight towards a pride of lions with one hungry female. Tourists Matt and Sharon Enright are expecting a quick kill, but both the lioness and the Enrights get the surprise of their lives when the baboon goes on the offensive. It was quite exciting at one point, you know, I was thinking, like, wow, can the baboon actually kill the lion? As exciting as it sounds, Dr. Paul Funston has a more realistic explanation for the lioness's cowardice. And she's not a very experienced hunter. She was intimidated by this baboon. I had kind of rooted for the underdog. She got a, a little more upset. Sharon, shut up. But the pride has had enough, and they step in to salvage the family reputation. While I was paying attention to the one line, the others came along and basically flanked or outflanked the baboon. <laughs> the other line. One 
is the loneliest number in the wild, and for this baboon, it wasn't nearly enough. The small town of Gisborne in New Zealand, a once sleepy fishing village. That's before over 2,000 kilograms of flesh and blubber turns up. This four metre long colossus, nicknamed Homer, is spoiling for a fight and it's Jamie Quirk's job to keep him from brawling in the street. was a super dog elephant seal. He was an interesting animal and you can still see the landscapes had an effect put on it by a home. That's the thing that really made him stand out. In the breeding season, elephant seals become fiercely territorial with the need to protect their harem of females against invading males. Homer does not have a harem yet and has chosen Gisborne as his training camp while he prepares for a shot at the title with the intensity of a professional prize fighter. Homer had a love-hate relationship with vehicles. He liked cream cars for some reason. What he's doing essentially is practicing defending his territory. So he's seeing all these cars coming into the harbour town as invaders. This seal is really saying to these cars, I'm rearing taller, I'm smashing down more, I am dominant, you are submissive and you have to leave this territory. But the giant's choice of punching bags is infuriating the locals. When those people write in the insurance dent caused by elephant seal, that's got to be a one-time thing for an insurance claims officer. Of course they're going to question it. But it's not just cars that get a pounding. A local woman uh, was down there one evening. She was singing him Maris songs, and she was sitting right next to him. Uh, Homer rolled over on top of her. Her arms were the only thing left hanging out from underneath Homer, and she was extremely lucky that there were two guys there who grabbed her arms and dragged her out from underneath him. That's comedy gold. Homer is determined to go the distance. Lumbering through the streets, he challenges all contenders. Um, we tried to get him out of the boat ramp by using water-filled barriers and stuff like that. Unfortunately, these didn't work because they're just not heavy enough. It just gave him another toy to play with. Homo definitely became a star. We had large tourist buses carrying 40 or 50 people arriving solely to come and see this elephant seal right in the middle of Brisbane City. And then as suddenly as he arrived, Homer was gone, back to the beaches of his colony. Some people are very sad. There were elderly ladies that would go down and see him every day. They looked after him, they were his minders. But those in the town of Gisborne who miss this four metre long Lothario can take comfort in the fact that he's now back where he belongs and more than likely surrounded by dozens of attentive females.